I knew that was coming, which is why I paused. <laughs> So hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Tavern Tastings Whiskey. My name is Mary Chaltas Ottomanelli. I am the Special Programs and Engagement Manager at Francis Tavern Museum. I am always joined by my wonderful co-host, Catherine Prescott, the Assistant Museum Director and Chief Curator at Keeler, Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center. Tonight, we're focusing on the distinctly American topic of whiskey. We'll be looking at the early history of whiskey in the United States, it, how it became the preferred drink of choice for colonists and its connection with westward expansion. And of course, we'll also take a look at its role in one of our nation's first major challenges against the federal government with the Whiskey Rebellion in the 1790s. This is our last lecture for season two of Tavern Tastings. We did it. Uh, we hope you enjoyed these lectures. I know we had a great time bringing all of you together and bringing this information to you guys. Um, as a note, we are sending out a survey with the recording from tonight's lecture. Please take a few minutes, fill it out, let us know questions, comments, concerns. And of course, if you have any suggestions for our next season, we are always willing to listen because we were talking about this the other day and I think we have some good ideas, but if it's reinforced, we will absolutely do them. Um, please take a few minutes, fill that out, and I will hand it over to Catherine. All right, welcome everyone. And I'm glad you could all join us for our discussion on whiskey. Um, but to begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that the history of our site does not start with Europeans. And to truthfully acknowledge our site's history and present experiences, it is important to recognize the beginnings of this place. So the town of Ridgefield, where Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center is, exists on the ancestral homelands of the Ramapo, Munsi Lenape, and Wishkwaiskek people. They were the original stewards of this land on which the Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center stands today. And we thank them for their strength and their resilience in stewarding this land. And we hope to continue their legacy of protecting the site and its history. So now that we've acknowledged uh, the, the first peoples who are here in, um, in North America and in Ridgefield, and, um, we're going to move ahead a little bit because uh, as far as I can tell, as far as research has shown us, um, the Native Americans did not actually have any distilling. Um, they had alcohol, they, were, they fermented um, corn and, and agave and various things. Um, native to them, but they were not doing any distilling. So uh, distilling is kind of a distinctly uh, European, Asian uh, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it seemed a little unclear when we look at these ingredients, we want to see where they came from. And I got a lot of mixed signals. <laughs> of like whiskey kind of just like shows up in places and it's not the whiskey that we know even today or about a hundred years ago that the the whiskey being distilled in the 16th and 17th century in Europe and in the United States with, with the early settlers and colonizers was un like it just shows up. Yeah I found that too and I think part of the problem is or I guess not problem, but one of the things is just about anything can be whiskey. Like the definition of whiskey is very broad. Yeah. I mean, it's just distilled fermented cereal grains. And like just about everything people eat kind of, conf everybody has a local cereal grain that would probably produce enough sugars to, to ferment and then distill. Um, so I think that's part of the issue is like early on, just about anything that wasn't brandy is going to be whiskey. <laughs> um, it's a very broad topic tonight. Yeah. Um, but then over time, you know, definitions become much more specific. Um, as we'll find out, it's mostly for tax purposes. Um, you know, everything kind of always boils down to that taxes and money and things like they, that yeah they start regulating it eventually because they're like you can only use this kind of grain it has to be in a barrel you have to do it at this temperature you have to put it in this kind of barrel it has to be stored at this temperature like 
again, I learned so much from tavern tastings about how liquor is produced because I did not know about any of this beforehand, that there's such a science behind making it that it makes me going to the liquor store a little bit more exciting of just being like, oh, I know how they make that now. Did you know about that barrel? Yeah, that's one of the fascinating things is now you can read the label and you kind of know, understand what they're telling you, right? I now understand um, proof. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I found kind of whiskey start showing up um, or something kind of that's basically whiskey starts showing up like the 15th century. That was around when I, I found um, that's about the same time just general distilling for consumption as opposed to perfume or mm -hmm. just experimentation became widespread. Um, and basically what they were doing is heating up, you know, a mix of all the leftovers from beer making or wine making. Um, you just like mix it with water and heat that up and then capture the steam and the, the alcohol um, kind of uh, gets captured. You can filter that out off. Um, and that's where you get uh, distilled spirits, um, which were called aqua vitae uh, or water of life. Um, and that kind of, that phrase shows up in a lot of different languages, right? You have aqua vit, um, in France you have eau de vie. Um, and then in Scotland and Ireland, you have, uh, and forgive me, I'm going to butcher this completely, um, Whiskibaha, Whiskibaha, I'm not sure um, how the Gaelic is pronounced, but uh, that's kind of the origin of the word whiskey, um, but it translates to water of life. So we go straight from this aquavitae. Um, into into whiskey yeah um it was interesting when i was looking at it especially when you're looking at american whiskey because there's so many different types of how it was produced and how it was regulated in different countries but when we looked at american whiskey it originally didn't start as a product that was meant to be marketed and sold for mostly public consumption because this was excess grain that the farmers had. And some of them made it into beer, but <clears throat> excuse me, beer is not as shelf stable as everybody thinks it is. So that would go bad and they didn't want to waste it. And it was easier to wildly enough, it was easier to distill whiskey to make the barrels and, and have it than it was to take those essentially raw materials of the grains of the rye, the corn, the wheat, and take it to a market to sell, or it would spoil that way. And it was, um, it, I mean, it went with everything. It was something that you drank morning, noon, and night. It was, a, it, I, listen, liquor, if I've learned anything, liquor will always sell better than corn as itself. If I've learned anything from the 18th century is that the raw material is never good, but if you can make something into liquor, people will buy it. And it gave them a little bit of extra cash or it gave them something to barter with and it helped the economy. Essentially, we see that whiskey becomes a main kind of cornerstone of the economy after the revolution, um, which is cool. I mean, the power of the farmer, the, the power of liquor is pretty, pretty interesting, I think. And that's, I think, my fun thing that I learned about this lecture. Yeah, I definitely think... Um... It's interesting the point where whiskey kind of takes off because it is, it's very sudden, mm -hmm. um, I found, because leading up to the revolution, there was some whiskey making. Um, I found the earliest kind of what people say, these, all these sources we, I looked at, um, so the earliest whiskey uh, was brewed or distilled in Virginia in 1620. Um, however, all of these sources can't agree on the guy's name, so <laughs> I'm not sure how, you know, um, it's either James Thorpe or George Thorpe, I saw uh, who was a missionary in, in Virginia. Um, and he, 
is quoted as having written in a letter. Uh, he says, we have found a way to make some good, uh, to make so good a drink of Indian corn. I have diverse times refused to drink good, strong English beer and chose to drink that. Hmm. Um, but none of these sources actually say for sure that this is a corn whiskey, that it's distilled. Um, it could just as easily be corn beer. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, but I think people really want to say whiskey's been here as long as European colonizers have been here. So um, they had to brew something because they yeah. had to drink and it was easier to brew and distill their own beer or whiskey or some sort of spirit here than it would be to wait for incoming ships to come in with more goods. It was out of, <laughs> they had to brew whiskey out of survival, Catherine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the question is, okay, was this distilled or not? Was it was it a beer, which is just fermented, or was it distilled into whiskey? Um, and it, it very well could have been. Um, but nobody kind of really knows for certain. Um, but then, I guess the whole point of what I was saying is, you know, from 1620 all the way up to the revolution, whiskey is just kind of in the background, right? And and rum is king uh, in, in the United States. And then all of a sudden, nobody can get molasses anymore because the British are blockading our ports and we've got to drink something. Um, so, so, you know, that's when whiskey kind of takes off. Um, but interestingly enough, whiskey doesn't seem to have been a thing in Ridgefield, like based on, obviously my records are only kind of Timothy Keeler and he was a pretty prominent person in town, but his records are only a portion of, you know, highlight only a portion of what's happening in Ridgefield. But there is a conspicuous lack of whiskey in Timothy's ledgers. I've looked through all of the ledgers we have from 1772 all the way up through his son's records in 1827 and I found one record um I found one entry for whiskey um and it's not even Timothy or William sharing selling whiskey it's somebody using whiskey to to pay off a debt um so I'm sharing my screen here and uh, you can see this, it's like pretty much one of the last entries in William Keeler's day book uh, from April 12th, uh, 1827. Uh, and William dies in October of this year. Uh, so this is very much near the end. And you can see Amos Smith is uh, paying off some debt. He is getting some credit by one and three quarter gallon of whiskey. Uh, so I found in these books, there's just about every other possible drink you can think of. Um, there's plenty of rum, there's tons of molasses, there's brandy, there's wine, there's, um, gin, you know, there's vinegar, there's this thing called cherry bounce, um, uh, which Ooh. is like a brandy with cherries in it. It sounds really good. Um but no whiskey. This is the only one um, I found. So I just thought that was like really interesting how conspicuous it was that whiskey wasn't present um, even after the revolution. So this is a mystery. Oh, so Alta said cherry bomb is the bomb. Cherry bounce is the bomb. I believe you and I trust you because why would that name lie to us? I can cooperate the fact that I told you earlier when we were doing our run through, I was so certain I was going to find Samuel Francis selling whiskey. I was like, I know we don't have many, many like documents. We have a few things. We've got receipts. We've got advertisements. I was like, I know. Look at this bar. Look at this bar. I know he has. I know. No whiskey, guys. None. I have an advertisement that I can share my screen. He. 
had mentions of wines, ports, punch, and other liquors that he would have in the tavern, no whiskey. And then I was like, let me go check the receipts because we're under the assumption in the Northeast rum was there because why would you have whiskey? Because rum is there. That is a, f- a favorite of everybody. That's their, that's their go-to drink, right? If you like a good rum, that's your drink. You're not going to change it. And then I was like, what other big celebration has Francis Tavern had? And I went to the receipts because we have the receipts from evacuation day when they drank the city dry. Nothing. <laughs> I still don't believe that there was no whiskey, but there's no documentation that there was whiskey. So I have advertisements. There was port, there was rum, there were punches made and other spirits. Some food is mentioned, but mostly liquor. No whiskey is mentioned in New York, like in, at Samuel Francis's tavern at these two kind of high points in his career for this tavern. And it's just, it's, I thought I had it this time. I was like, we're going to go out on season two and I'm going to bring primary documents from the tavern to the table. And I felt so disappointed in myself. (laughs) But it really does go to show you the fact that whiskey and the way that we think about it is truly just not a port city drink. It was kind of made from the frontier by frontiersmen and farmers because that's where it was grown because it was easy. It was there. Um, I saw some questions coming too. What was the most popular beverage in the tavern? Uh, Chris, that's a great question. He loved to sell beer. If I've learned anything, beer was a really big one. Port gets mentioned a lot. Um, Sometimes Madeira. So Francis, because you can't see out of these windows and it's not the 18th century, but we were right next to the Great Dock. So there are ships coming into the harbor 24 seven Francis is literally ordering anything he can get his hands on to make his tavern the best tavern in New York city. I am biased because I work here, but I think he did a really good job. Um, the cooking was fantastic. So I can only imagine that the liquor selection would have matched that. So honestly, I'm sure if you walked in and you were like, give me something of your best quality, he would probably hand you the best rum in the world maybe an over-exaggeration, but I'll say it. Uh, But yeah, they, they love drinking. I can't imagine that he didn't have whiskey. I can't imagine that Francis was like, I won't try this new whiskey, like liquor out at my, for my patrons. That seems very silly. Sherry was mentioned as well. I think maybe a little bit, but not much. Um, The receipt is actually available on library of Congress. If you, I think Google Samuel Francis evacuation day receipt that should pop up. You do have to kind of contrast it a lot because it's very, very low. Um, the ink is disappearing from that piece of paper, which is great. Uh, but you can slowly read it. There's a lot of liquor that night. <laughs> yeah. Um, at Keeler Tavern, we don't have many um, tavern specific records um, because Timothy also ran a general store literally off of the tavern. Um, so most of his, the records we do have are from the store, but by far the thing he is selling the most of is rum. Uh, you know, every, everybody is buying rum like every week. Um, it's a gallon here, half a gallon there, you know, um, so for, for sure rum and then cider is the other big one we find, um, you know, per usual when we did our apple, uh, talk last year, I didn't find any cider references. And then the week after I found them all. Um, So who knows next week, maybe all the whiskey references will will pop up, Um, but they were not to be found for tonight. Such as life. Uh, And yes, Gail says rum was part and parcel of the the slave trade. Um, That's true. That was the one kind of leg of the triangle trade is the Northeast sent, Northeast colony sent rum to Africa in exchange for um, the, the enslaved who were then taken to the Caribbean. So yes, it was, it was very much tied to the slave trade. Um, all right, so we, uh, and I said, Demetra, uh, hard cider, yes, it was definitely hard cider. 
Um, you kind of store cider for a little bit and it turns hard. It, it becomes alcoholic. Um, so yes, it was, it was definitely hard cider. Um, and I think we had a lot of, uh, comments and questions about the whiskey rebellion. So, uh, mm -hmm. that was definitely a key part of, uh, the history of whiskey in, in America. Um, and definitely a big test to a brand new nation. It had everything. <laughs> it's got the, the writings of the Hamilton musical because Hamilton started the Whiskey Rebellion and I stand it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> Hamilton comes back to him. Yeah, Hamilton can, can pretty much take the blame for the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, basically, the gist of it is that um, the U.S. had a lot of debt after the revolution, right? And Hamilton decided that the best way to take care of all this debt was to tax not only imported goods, but domestic made uh, spirits as well. Uh, and so he decided to put a tax on whiskey. Um, and it didn't go well. It did not go over very well. Uh, and part of the reason was that people thought, and it's probably true, Hamilton was a bit elitist, um, that it favored the elite Northeast uh, city distillers over all of these people in the frontier uh, who were making whiskey. Uh, and so, because part of the, the thing was uh, the tax had to be paid in cash and a lot of the people in the frontier were using whiskey for, as currency, right? And so, they a don't have cash to pay this tax but also that it's it's essentially becoming like an income tax if you're being taxed on your whiskey mm -hmm. that you're using as currency mm -hmm. um so yeah and then there were there's kind of a lot i did actually find the um text of this law um which is really interesting like these early tax laws that congress passed like all of the first acts of congress were all taxes of some sort or another which i thought was really ironic since they just fought a war to not be taxed um, but that was their whole discussion though that was the federalists uh like claim hamilton was like well we fought this revolution so that we were all representate we were all under representation, you know, taxation with no representation. They're like, well, now we're all represented and we all fought for the same thing. So now we can. And it was like, again, watching a lawyer think of like, I mean, like, okay, fine. You're technically right. But think about what you're doing <laughs> and watching them and reading these tax codes. is like how they were getting around it and watching the anti-federalists and, and Jefferson just be like, no, that that's not that's not right. You can't do this because like you said, a lot of these farmers, their cash and their bartering system was done on whiskey. And when you have to pay this tax in person with cash, think about how large Pennsylvania is, right? We can't just take the highway on our cars these days. It's you have to travel from the outskirts of a very large state, even in Kentucky, where a lot of the whiskey was being produced. You have to travel that way. You have to go hundreds of miles to Philadelphia to pay a tax that you can't even necessarily afford. And you are traveling through unknown lands, right? So there's indigenous tribes that may not be friendly to travelers or people in their area. They are a constant danger of being attacked by animals as well, because this is mountains and the forests. And it was not an easy tax. It's not just saying, okay, cool. Can I have some of your whiskey? Just give us that. And they sent the tax collectors around. This was a very personal tax i think like you were saying it was a, a little intrusive for the 1790s i think after again just fighting a war on individual rights hamilton yeah. mm, they don't mention that in the musical it's weird yeah um and i think you know as, as i was saying I, if you have the chance definitely go search up the text for this um it's really interesting um you can actually find it on wiki source uh, they have the the text for 
all of the early uh, congressional acts. Um, but it's really interesting the way they're taxing. So everything is broken down by proof. Um, so depending on how strong your alcohol is, you're going to pay more or less tax, um, which led me into this whole thing about learning about proof and <laughs> alcohol proof, um, which is very complex. Um, but uh, it was in interesting. And the other thing that I didn't know before um, that I found out from reading this is that this whiskey tax, as it became known, uh, also tax the stills um, that were used to distill the um, distill the whiskey. So, but one of the things that was very specifically stated in the tax is it was you had to pay. Um, let me see. I can't remember. I think I have the note here. Um, you had to pay sixty cents per gallon capacity of your still. Uh, for for any still that wasn't located in a city, or a town, or a village, um, which a lot of these frontier stills were not going to be in incorporated villages. Um, so again, that's one of those like the law favors North American, um, northeastern New England, kind of more urban big distillers commercial distillers as opposed to these um, small guys. So I thought that was a really interesting addition to, to the whole thing about taxing the whiskey itself. I had a comment come in from Greg, who's been giving us great information throughout the chat in tonight's section. I'm just going through it. Uh, we are being challenged on our history, which is totally possible. It is absolutely possible, Greg. We are not perfect. Uh, it could be possible that we are wrong. I will be the first to say it. I am not perfect. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. No, I do, I do think. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, uh, I do think Greg is right. So paying the tax, you didn't have to travel. But um, if you were fined or kind of convicted for not paying your tax, you then had to go to court, federal court. Um, and in Pennsylvania, the federal court was in Philadelphia. Um, so I oh, think okay. that's where we kind of uh, got it mixed up a little bit. Um, oh. But yeah, you didn't travel to pay the tax. But if you were fined Fine. or convicted okay. for, or of something, you know, for not paying your tax, you did, then did have, were supposed to travel to, um, to Philadelphia. Oh, well, sorry for that mix up. I'm glad that you caught it, though. <laughs> uh, do speaking of the tax collectors and tarring and feathering, I was able to find this really interesting cartoon uh, because I thought it was great. Uh, you can see it is a tax collector. You can see the tar and feathering in the background. Um, I particularly love this little critter of a friend um, and the fact that they like most tax collectors, if we learned anything from the revolution, we're not friendly. We uh, Americans were not friendly to these tax collectors again, because we fought a whole war to get rid of them. Uh, so the actual rebellion, so all of these laws start to come into play around the early 1790s, Hamilton pushes for this. And then by 1794, uh, things really start to escalate, I think is the best way to summarize the lead sentence of the Whiskey Rebellion because me and Catherine were talking about there's no elevator pitch for this because there's so many different layers of what was going on and it wasn't necessarily even in Pennsylvania but uh, activity was also happening in Kentucky but uh, it's not really known because people in Kentucky would have to if they were coming towards highly populated areas in the capital they would have to cross back over mountains uh, which is not an easy thing to do but if I was angry enough I probably would have maybe tried as well. Uh, this cartoon is a really good one. Carrying off two kegs of whiskey is pursued by two farmers intending to tar and feather him. He runs for squire vultures to, to divide with him, but is met on the way by his evil genius who claps and claps a hook in his nose, leads him off to a gallows where he is immediately hanged. People seeing him hang, put a barrel of whiskey underneath him and blow him up. Um, one of my new favorite cartoons, honestly. Um, so 
the rebellion kind of that we know today that we refer back to starts in Pittsburgh. Um, let me just stop the screen and we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, I lost my train of thought. Hold on. <laughs> it happens. Um, there are mobs on and off, I should say, between 1791 and 1794, but in 1794, um, a bunch of men around Pittsburgh go to the house of John Neville, who is a regional supervisor for collection of the federal excise tax in Western Pennsylvania. So they knew where he was, they went to his house and they demanded, uh, he resigned his position essentially of what he was doing because they didn't appreciate the tax, which is fair. Um, Obviously things do not go well. Um, Neville does not stand down uh, and bad things start happening. <laughs> he refused and shots were fired. Uh, the ensuing battle, five of the attackers were wounded and one of them later died. Um, I have my notes in front of me because I have, I had to break it down day by day because it was like July 16th, the first uh, group of men formed in front of his house. And then on July 17th, 1794, uh, estimates between four and 800 locals returned to the scene. 400 people is a lot, but 800 people is a lot more. Um, that is a big number to kind of differentiate between. Um, I hope it wasn't 800, but it could possibly be. Um, this time he was protecting his home with the help of some enslaved people and 11 soldiers from the nearby Fort Pitt. And then there were more exchanges of fire. He barely escaped or was able to escape. That seemed a little off. Um, I guess also depending on what narrative you're looking at, you don't wanna be like, oh, he barely escaped, but you wanna be the hero of that story and be like, no, no, he escaped, he was cool. Um, and then the mob burned his entire property down. Uh, so when we say people were very angry and we talk about the whiskey rebellion, it's not just the idea of being able to produce whiskey. It is your livelihood and your right to kind of survive in this environment. Um, living in the frontier was very difficult. You didn't have a lot of money. And the fact that the federal government was basically on the heels of another war coming after some more of your cash is very upsetting. Yeah, it's, um, and I think one of the things we know, the Whiskey Rebellion um, is kind of associated with Western Pennsylvania um, because that is where uh, George Washington ends up um, leading forces to try mm -hmm. and put down this rebellion in Pittsburgh. Uh, but it is important to note that uh, there were kind of mobs and outbreaks and fighting in uh, Kentucky, uh, which was then part of Virginia. Um, kind of the, and um, kind of in the Kentucky frontier. So, but again, as Mary said, getting to Kentucky was a little more difficult than getting to Pittsburgh. Um, but yeah, so in 1794, uh, Washington ends up raising a calling for a militia to muster um, and he becomes the first and only sitting president to lead troops on the, a battlefield. I guess you would call it a battlefield. Um, and it's in, a lot of militia. It's, yeah, 12, it's like thir thir almost 13,000 men. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did read one single source that speculated that part of the reason why Washington actually called the militia was to see if people would respond, kind of to test whether or not the federal government would be able to muster a force. Um, but I've only I only saw one source that speculated along those lines, so I don't I don't know. I have to do more reading on that. But I thought that was really interesting that it was not only this, you know, rebellion. Um, but there was also this kind of test run of, of the federal government um, in other ways as well. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. I think if you go along those lines, um, you, you want to think Washington was testing himself to see if he would be a strong leader still outside of the war and the role of a president and what that meant and 
the role of the federal government because it was still kind of being tested. I mean, we're on the heels of the Constitution. We've moved on from our articles and we're, we're still a baby, I think is a very important time to remember. Like there's that newborn infant stage of this nation where laws that we have today seem very established and we have lots of precedents and they, this, this was Washington creating that precedent. And I can't imagine how horrifying it must be to have to be the president and have to muster more militia to put down a rebellion about taxes. And it must feel like the twilight zone almost for them. Um, but yeah, they, they make it to Pittsburgh. They've got 13,000 men who turned out. And I imagine he was very happy about that call to action. I mean, to follow Washington again for another fight is very impressive. It's, it's Washington, right? He's our, he's our founding father. So uh, they ended up getting to Pittsburgh. And then from my sources, it wasn't, oh, Greg is so wonderful with the knowledge tonight. Thank you so much for sending these comments in. It wasn't commercial wasn't commercial distilleries, it was personal distilleries to convert grain into something transportable and barterable. Interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, they end up uh, apprehending about 150 to 200 men. Again, those records seem to be a little wishy-washy, but still 150 to 200 men. It is still quite a large number of arrests at the time um, in Pittsburgh. And they hoped, I don't know if they were able to bring them to trial. Again, that seemed, I wasn't able to get that because the charges against them were going against the federal government. And again, these are precedents of how do you charge these people? But again, cabinet is full of lawyers who could possibly find something to charge you with at this point. Uh, but only two were convicted is what I was able to find. Yeah. Which, yeah. That's what I found. Two were convicted, but they were later pardoned. So, yeah. Um, you know, things. Um, and Sandra asked, who were the two convicted? I do not recall their names. I was unable to find a name as uh, well, but that's, we can probably dig for them as well. Yeah. I, um, did, I did read, read them and then I forgot to write them down and then I couldn't find it again. So. Yeah. Uh, it's, it was probably just a show of action of, the federal government considering that they only ended up arresting two of them two were convicted and then kind of let on their way um amazingly enough the the tax on whiskey was not immediately repealed yeah yeah the, uh... learn a lesson <laughs> um i think afterwards the federal government just kind of allowed people to not pay the tax they didn't enforce it as much um the tax was not just on domestically produced um whiskey it was also taxed domestically produced rum and um foreign distilled liquors as well that were imported in um it included a, an increase in import duties for um imported spirits uh but yeah it sticks around until 1802 um when Jefferson comes into office and, you know, he was a small government um, guy. And so he actually repealed all federal, internal federal taxes. Um, so not just this one, he actually repealed another tax that, uh, or yeah, it was a tax, it was a duty uh, that affected Timothy Keeler, um, which was a 19, or 1794 duty on licenses for selling wines and foreign distilled spiritus liquors by retail. Um, so I mentioned that Timothy uh, had a general store uh, attached to his, his, um, his tavern. And one of his things was he mostly sold rum, but he did sell um, things like wines and gin um and brandy which mostly came from france there was some produced locally um but so in 1794 congress uh enacts a a duty and on licenses so you have to now get a license to sell retail um these liquors 
And so Timothy, you know, he goes and applies for a license and he does get one, um, which we have in our collection. Um, so I'm gonna show you here. This one, we keep it hanging up right in the, um, the tap room. Uh, but it says, whereas Timothy Keeler of the town of Ridgefield in the county of Fairfield in the District of Connecticut hath duly made application for a license to sell by retail foreign distilled spiritus liquors. Um, and he's hereby licensed to sell by retail foreign distilled spirits at his store in the town aforesaid. Um, so, you know, after this point, Timothy is allowed to sell uh, up to 20 gallons of uh, foreign distilled spirits that his customers can take off the premises. Um, this act does not affect tavern keepers who are, are licensed. Um, so licensed tavern keepers can still sell liquor for consumption on their properties. Um, that's not uh, affected by this tax, um, this act here. Uh, and so, but this one, this act as well is repealed in 1802 by Thomas Jefferson. So he just kind of blank is like, okay, no more federal taxes on domestic products. No more federal taxes is basically um, a very simplified version of what Jefferson was. Um, because people always talk about Jefferson repealed the tax on whiskey. And it wasn't because he was like, fond of whiskey or anything actually Jefferson didn't really like whiskey all that much um, he was a wine guy um, so yeah he just he was a anti-federal tax guy is what it was yeah there was I, I know we were talking a lot about the the tavern license and you were looking into those laws and taxes on imported liquor and imported goods versus domestic goods and obviously reminds us a lot of taxes that we pay today on everything and when we go to the grocery store and the liquor store. Uh, it's, it's interesting to kind of see that growth of how they tried to pay back the debt because it was significant. It was somewhere in the, I think I wrote it on some $50 million or something like that. Some yeah. large amount. Um, so I, 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 I get where Hamilton was coming from of like, we have this large whiskey production, uh, but probably the wrong call. <laughs> probably the wrong call. Uh, and just how the federal government responds to it, how Washington responds to it. He puts out a few statements. There's about three statements you can, they're on uh, Library of Congress, so you can easily Google them. They're obviously worth the read. Um, usually anytime our first president puts out any kind of statement, it sets a precedent of how to handle things. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how our first, it sounds silly to say a hiccup because I think that undercuts what happened, but hiccup feels right for right now, but how the nation as a whole handled it versus the government and the people and the interactions between it. And yeah, I don't know. I'm still forming that sentence. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Melissa asked, was the whiskey exported? Um, so I did not find a whole lot on whiskey exporting. Um, for the most part, the whiskey was, it wasn't, for the most part, there weren't commercial distilleries, right? It was mostly farmer distillers who were distilling the, the whiskey as a way to basically store all this excess corn that they have, and then they can use it to barter um, with their neighbors, with people. But I did find um, that a lot of, um, that whiskey was actually floated uh, down to New Orleans. Um, the port of New Orleans was a huge spot for, um, whiskey coming out of the, the American frontier, the Appalachian frontier. Um, and they, it was something like in the first quarter of the, the 19th century, the amount of whiskey going through the port of New Orleans increased from like 11,000 barrels or something like to like over 
a hundred thousand. Don't quote me on these numbers. I'm, I did I not write them down. <laughs> I, I did find those numbers. Um, yeah, 1812, the port of New Orleans saw 11,000 gallons of whiskey. And then by 1816, so we're talking four years, um, went up to 320,000 gallons. That is a big increase in four years. So that shows yeah. how much extra corn was being distilled. Uh, yeah, it became a very serious business. I don't know if it was exported. I mean, I'm sure somebody probably tried to, to see if that would catch on. Um, but I do. Um, so this is when I visited, uh, Mount Vernon, Washington's Mount Vernon. Um, and, uh, Washington, after he leaves the presidency, he goes home and he actually starts a, um, a whiskey distillery. Uh, he has a, a Scottish uh, master distiller um, who kind of helps him set up this. And he was a huge producer of whiskey uh, by the time of his death. And when I was at Mount Vernon, I believe they said that he was actually exporting to Europe um, some whiskey. I think they said he went, sent it to France. Um, and But that also, that's, you know, General George Washington, former President George Washington. So his uh, <laughs> experience, his business opportunities are probably very different from, you know, your average farmer in the Monongahela. Um, <laughs> right? I think so. Yeah. Uh, it's also the 19th century saw a really big boost in regulating the production of whiskey and the production of whiskey coming down to a science. You had a lot of Scott, uh, Scott Irish people coming in who knew how to make it, knew how to make whiskey um, coming here and taking those techniques and applying them to the frontier whiskey that they were making here in the United States. Um, and there were a few people, I had his name written down. Um, 1820, Dr. James Crow immigrated from the Scottish Highlands, and he is one of the greatest visionaries, was the direct quote that I was reading, um, because he was learning how to do temperature control, regulating the temperature while you were distilling it, and I would imagine making it more of the whiskey that we taste today, rather than you distilled it, you barreled it, and you got what you got from each barrel um, because there's so many different factors of like your access to clean water or what kind of water supply you were using, how you were making the barrels, how you were flavoring the barrels was also like a big thing. Um, there's so many different layers to make, <laughs> taking the corn and making another essentially like good from it um, that by the 1820s and the 1830s, you start to see this boom again coming out from New Orleans and those ports and people taking this as like a serious industry and moving more from farming to being a specific whiskey distillery and doing that full time. Uh, cool. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, the, the 1820s is when we start to see um, kind of rules and regulations being set for what constitutes whiskey and specific types of whiskey. Um, this is where you also start getting um, like bourbon being specifically bourbon and mean that meaning a specific thing. Um, and uh, so one of the things I did find out, which I did not know before, um, is like the, all the definitions of types of whiskey, right? So you have Irish whiskey and Scott, you know, Scotch whiskey, which are both barley, um, and I believe they're malted whiskeys. Um, but then you have bourbon, which has to be like 51% corn, um, and it's aged in charred oak barrels. Um, and then you've got rye whiskey, which was historically from uh, the stuff you would find in, in Pennsylvania and Maryland. Um, so that was made out of rye rather than corn. Um, Canadian whiskey. Canadian whiskey, yeah. Um, and 
uh, there's also, you can also have wheat whiskey, right? Because we said whiskey is anything that comes from a cereal grain. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I don't know that there was much wheat whiskey going on in, in the United States. Um, wheat did not grow very well. There was a, an outbreak of uh, stuff that killed wheat. So, um, but I think one of the things that really surprised me is because I, the one thing I knew about whiskey is like, it's in these barrels that are, it has to age, right? And it ages in these charred barrels and that's what gives it its color and it's like flavor. Um, but 18th century whiskey generally was not, they, they didn't char the barrels. It was just whatever barrel you had, you put the whiskey in it to store it. And if it aged, it was because you just didn't drink it fast enough. <laughs> Uh, and so in that case, I think 18th century whiskey was a little bit more like what we might think of as like moonshine. Yeah. Um, where it was like clear, it was probably pretty potent. Uh, and uh, so I think that was one of the, my big takeaways is just understanding the difference between what we're talking about in the 18th century and what Washington was making and drinking versus what we get at the liquor store today. Totally different, totally different, completely different experiences. Uh, we had a great question coming from Caroline. Did people drink whiskey in shots or did they sip it or mix it with water? Um, my best guess with tavern knowledge is that it would have been a mixture of all of those. Um, honestly. If you're having a bad day, you can just take the shot. If you're having a good time, you could just take the shot. If you wanted to water it down, you could use some water. More likely, it was also used in like a huge punch situation of kind of throwing everything in, throwing in some fresh fruit and calling it a day as well. Um, yeah, I think the rules kind of still apply today of how, I mean, I hope I, I have the scene from the office of Michael Scott putting Splenda packets into his whiskey or scotch. He was drinking some liquor and it was like Splenda packets, which is horrifying to me. But I imagine the rules still apply of you can sip it. You can take that shot immediately. You can mix it. Um, personal preference is personal preference. Yeah. I For some of the other liquors, I did find, you know, various recipes um, for kind of essentially the precursors to mixed drinks right um but i didn't find any for whiskey so i think for the most part it was just like drunk straight um <laughs> oh. and it, it might have been kind of watered down um or probably what it was is anything you made with rum you would just swap out and use whiskey instead um so typically like a punch a rum punch which would have been one of the most popular drinks um, in a tavern, you just swap out the rum for the whiskey. Um, yeah. A hot toddy, you swap out the rum for the whiskey, um, things like that. But I think for the most part, it was either drunk straight or it would be watered down um, into like a grog type situation um, because it was pretty potent. Um, <laughs> and I can't imagine, it's, because one of the things I found out about the amount of whiskey being drunk was outstanding. Like it was I, more than beer. Uh, way more than beer. Just the yeah. amount of alcohol period was ridiculous. Look at this um, room. Don't you want to party in this room? Look at this room. <laughs> yeah, no, but I found, so um, I found, a couple of statistics. In 1770, the average person over the age of 15 uh, was drinking three and a half gallons of alcohol per year. And that's like straight um, alcohol, the, the ethanol alcohol. Um, so it's the equivalent of 8.75 gallons of 80 proof liquor every year. But by 1830, uh, they're drinking the equivalent of uh, 90 bottles of 80 proof liquor a year. So that's like about a 1.7 bottles a week. Can you imagine like just the sheer amount of alcohol that was 
being consumed in this country <laughs> in the 1830s is outstanding. Um, to compare the um, this article said that in 2018, the average American drank um, about 2.4 gallons of, of alcohol a year. So it's like a third of what was uh, the average person drank in 1830. Oh my so, goodness. Oh you know, my goodness. Um, it's taking me back to my college days to hear those numbers. And I'm like, <laughs> oh no, I had, they had, I had nothing on the colonists. Yeah, no. <laughs> Ooh, that is a lot. I just, and I'm picturing it tasting a lot like moonshine. Cause like you said, the liquor that we have today, because it's so regulated and it's down to a science of what you need and germ control essentially also as well is that I can't, I just moonshine. I can, I can feel my nose hairs like falling out. If you had opened up a bottle of something like that, which is just like, oof. Yeah. yeah, Gail said safe drinking water was not always available. Alcohol uh, in some ways, yes, was safer. It was the preferred choice. I mean, you have instances when we did our ale lecture talking about children who woke up and had ale. Uh, I am very glad that we have access to safe drinking water right now. Yeah. Uh, really happy about that. Yeah. And then Sandra said, Canadian whiskey has to be aged at least three years in Canada in wooden barrels no larger than 700 liters. Yeah, there's, it's just a science now of what counts as a whiskey, how it's a whiskey, how you make it. I just, like the science, and I, I through tavern tastings, have learned truly it is a science to make liquor um, and how interesting it has evolved of now you have farmers from corn who have excess surplus and they want to do something with it. And they make whiskey and now I can go to the store and buy whiskey and it's completely different and it's a completely different experience. It's so fascinating to me. Think of what the water was like. Yeah, Greg, I can't imagine that the water was good. I, <laughs> yeah, no. And especially in an urban center like New York. Yeah. Mm -mm. Oh, yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. So yeah, it, it makes sense. You know, the, the amount of alcohol in, whatever form being drunk is definitely going to be more, but I think three times that, you know, the equivalent of one, nearly two bottles a week is, is quite a lot. You have to stay hydrated. I can't tell you how. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right. Which I mean, goes to show you that um, even back then, even with the amount of alcohol being drunk, people were still talking about the dangers of alcohol consumption. Um, you know, Benjamin Rush, uh, who was one of the founding fathers, he signed the, the constitution. Um, and he was one of the first people to consider alcoholism as a disease rather than a moral failing. Um, but it really is, you can see the amount of alcohol being drunk and this, that height in 1830 really does tie into the beginnings of the temperance movement. Um, and you can see how it does end up, you know, with you, at the end of the line, you get prohibition. And even after prohibition was uh, repealed, we, we've never gotten back anywhere near those levels again, so. That's probably for the best. we are nearing up on our time i'm slowly going through the comments i think as Catherine is to make sure that we got everybody's comments and questions in as best as we could francis tavern is yeah francis tavern was not far from the collect pond uh which was also super disgusting um i new york city is gross today so i can't imagine what it looked like in the 18th century i just Sights and sounds, ladies and gentlemen, but nobody thinks about the smell. Uh, all right. So um, I, we, are, we are at the end, Catherine, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and there was some great, Greg actually put some great information in the chat. Thank you, yes. Greg. Um, yeah, the Whiskey Rebellion is super complex. It's, it's a lot more complex than I even really knew before I started doing this. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, Greg, everything you added um, just kind of helps, helps fill this out because 
you know, there's all these little details. But again, I would um, really recommend if you have the the interest, go read some of these early, go read the whiskey tax, um, some of these early taxes on on liquors and stuff like that. It was super interesting. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you all so much. We are so grateful for everybody tuning in month after month for these tavern tastings. Me and Catherine have a an absolute riot putting these together and it's always good to see thank yous and the same names pop up. So thank you for supporting us for season two. Thank you for supporting Francis Tavern Museum and Keeler Tavern uh, Museum and History Center. Uh, <laughs> we very much appreciate it. Please fill out that survey when you are given your email probably tomorrow or the next day when this goes out. We really do uh, appreciate comments, questions, concerns, and of course, suggestions for next season because I think we're ready to do season three. Uh, but I digress. Um, uh, Gail, the, the other recordings are available on both of our institutions, YouTube. So you can find those recordings. These are all recorded. Uh, some of them come with additional resources, um, but please support us. Sign up for our newsletters, come to our other events. We hope to see you in person in the next couple of weeks as we slowly start to reopen again. Um, but it's always good to see everybody virtually. So thank you everybody and have a wonderful evening. Uh, thank you everyone. And we'll see you in the fall for season three. Woo! You can't see my hands, but they're going. <laughs> thank you everybody. <laughs>